the first thing that I would like to say is that it's just been a huge pleasure. Um, what a great part of my day to have three of my favourite musicians in here playing music. We haven't had music for a little while due to COVID, etc. And then we um, came along. And then you guys came along and ruined it all. <laughs> um, Peace and quiet. It's Mike's sound at the piano is such a formative part of my own education. You were my first teacher in my university. Um, and your compositions are, are one of the things that um, really ignited my own passion for composing my own music, etc. Um, what was the title of that tune that you guys It's called played? The Dirge. And is that from the recent uh, The World? It's um, from the record, but actually I wrote this song when I was about 16, oh, 16 wow. or 17. <laughs> it's one of those things I keep revisiting this, this music. And so what, what is it about a composition like that that makes you want to keep revisiting it? How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep reinventing it? It's so, it's very clear and it's very simple. And like I, you know, I'm basically self-taught. And in the beginning, what I used to do, I'd hear music on the radio that I couldn't possibly play. So I started writing my own music that I could play. And that's what I've done. That's what I still do most of the time. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? A lot of us always sound always in our element when we're actually playing our own compositions. I guess it's built around our own hands, our own sound. Yes. Yeah. It's funny, though. I, I remember even back in university days, we got to play quite a lot of your compositions, actually. You would offer them. And I remember playing compositions from uh, horn players, for example, great compositions, great standards, etc. But there was always something about your compositions, I guess, as a piano player that made perfect sense in terms of where the hand sat, where the voicings sat. Um, I think your sense of melody and sense of voice leading was one of the things that I always have aspired to sort of since, since that time. Um, is there any one thing or, uh, you know, a couple of things that you could um, isolate that would be your concept, your approach to melody and, and voice leading, etc. Well, that's a very interesting question. You know, like, uh, I've always tried to play music, particularly jazz music, that's going to be fun for the other musicians to play. So I think about the other musicians first. You know, not in terms of the melody, of course, the melody, but even that's part of it. It's like, I want to have a melody that's memorable mm. because if it's too complicated, you very quickly, you know, in other words, you don't need a lot of stuff. You need it to be quite condensed because if you're going to improvise on it, mm. that's going to be your, your jumping off point. Yeah. You know, so that's one of the things. I always tried to keep it relatively simple and not simplistic. I mean, there's a difference between, you know, it's, it's got to be interesting, mm. but it's also got to be easily, easily uh, infused in your body. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That's a that's big thing for me. So mm. that's always what I strive for. And, and still, even when I'm writing solo piano music, I still have to make it easy, even though I, I spent so much time working on making it easy. Yeah, right. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's a big difference between something that um, is simplistic but still has um, a real depth and a real sophistication to it, isn't there? And that, Absolutely. that's probably that balance that we all strive for. How do you find playing that, that sort of music? You've played with so many different uh, rhythm sections over the years, for example, and now you, you come to play a tune that was written many, many years ago now with uh, two of people who also I've had some of my most wonderful music experiences throughout my years. I've been very fortunate to play both with Hamish and Jonathan. Um, these guys probably have one of the best bass and drum hookups that I've ever experienced, actually. Um, you guys have played together in so many different um, situations, so many different ensembles, so many different guises, whether there's a saxophone out front, whether there's a vocalist out front. Um, how do you guys find playing with different piano players and vice versa, Mike? How do you find playing your music with these, with these two gentlemen? Well, I find it great because one of the things I really have to have around me is comfort. Mm. If I'm not comfortable, I can't play. Yep. You know, or the, the, to the degree of comfort, then the better I can play. Mm. And these guys, of course, are comfortable yep. to play with. So that's it right there. Yeah, well. It's a thing a lot of young musicians don't get, you know, I mean, because it's, that's, it's a whole deceptively simple. Yeah, right. 
Jonathan, what about you? You've played in so many different contexts. How do you find playing with Mike, playing with that relationship that you've had with Hamish for so many, many years? Oh, I just, I love these guys, uh, you know, to bits. Um, uh, Hamish and I have, have, have played for many, many years and um, I think our, well, certainly in, in my mind, the, the, the sort of the space between the notes is um, extremely linked. Um, it feels like that to me anyway. Um, and of course, Mike was uh, uh, my teacher at the Conservatorium of Music in my second year when I was there. Mm. And um, I sort of moved uh, heaven and earth to get into his class. <laughs> and then we spent the next year arguing because you know, I, was, I, I had a lot that. to learn. <laughs> um, but what I have learned um, in part can be attributed to Mike and, and the ideas that he was putting into my head at that time and, and confronting certain beliefs about music that I had. I mean, for me, the whole kind of my own history with, with a relationship with music over, over a long time has been learning the basic uh, ideas of um, listening. We, we all have to listen mm -hmm. uh, and to sublimate ourselves to, um, to the music, whatever that means individually to people. But um, I, I couldn't be in a better place playing with these two. I just, yeah, yeah I'm very happy. Sure. Yep. Hamish, what about you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, obviously I agree. Uh, Jonathan, just for, for a rhythm section, Jonathan and I played a lot together and um, I was thinking uh, it's like, it's always like, I know it's a weird term, but, you know, it's like wearing old shoes, like comfortable shoes. So when Jonathan's on the gig, there's a whole other thing that happens and there's a whole other thing that I don't, I, I, I'm not conscious of because it just feels really normal and feels mm. great, you know. Um, playing with Mike is always an experience, you know, it's an amazing, you know, as you mentioned, the compositions, I think Mike's compositions are, have always been really intriguing for me. And uh, um, just on the, sort of, you know, playing music, I guess, um, I, for so long, I've just tried to kind of get a groove on, you know, like just um, make things feel good. Um, I've never, you know, I pursued the technique thing to a point, and mm. then at some point, I, I mean, obviously, I'm always working on my technique as a drummer, mm. but as a musician and someone that loves music, I'm trying to create sounds that that fit with the music, and that comes back to what Jonathan said about listening. It's, uh, um, it's all about listening for me and, and uh, all about making my part of the jigsaw fit as beautifully or as heavy or as scary or as delightful or light or whatever it is to the music that, that I'm playing, you know. With, and with these guys, it's amazing because every, like we just, well, we just did a tour before our little virus hit. We just come off the road doing a tour, and every time we we played the record, we played the tunes in the order of the record. Um, it was different every, you know. Obviously, it's a jazz group; it's different every night. But it really was different, and everybody's attitude was like, "We're just, you know, I'm going to lay out for the first chorus or whatever. It doesn't matter." And it was, it, that's the attitude that I'm sort of always trying to incorporate, especially in a situation like this where you can, we can let the music dictate what you play mm -hmm. rather than I'm going to play my, I'm going to do my thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I just find that there's a, um, a great sense of spirit always, particularly when Mike's at the instrument, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, ever since I first saw Mike play, spirit is the word that, that comes to mind. Um, and even though we can all be directive and, and we have a sense of self, mm. um, I believe that probably the most beautiful thing about the music that we hear right now is that we bring that, that sense of energy and that spirit every single time, but we also bring a sense of selflessness 
Mm. Um, the music sounds really, really unselfish, which means that everybody's listening and everybody's incredibly supportive. Um, and it's just a joy to listen to. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Our pleasure. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. We've got time for one more tune, gents. Oh, yeah. Grand. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, what a beautiful vehicle um, for you three musicians to inhabit. That's a composition of yours, Jonathan? Yes. And in the night comes rain. Yes. Was it written specifically for the album This World? Uh, well, no, because it was written probably before before this uh, before this world was was even a twinkle in anyone's eye. But it was written for Mike Knopf. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, it absolutely sounds like that. Yeah. Um, we are obviously missing the delightful Julian Wilson, who is. Um, the most wonderful exponent of um, music in Australia. I, I adore Julian's playing. I think he's potentially my favourite saxophonist in the world. But either way, that actually sounds like it was written for a piano trio and no less it really does sound like it just fits straight into, into Mike's hands. So it's interesting that you actually geared it directly for his, his musicianship. Um, it's a really beautiful vehicle. It's very, very reminiscent of all of those gorgeous sounds that that um, I fell in love with so many years ago. Um, Voicing-wise, melody-wise, um, does it fall into your hands pianistically? Is it something you have to earn coming from a different composer? Or no, well, Jonathan's got a real uh, classical sensitivity, mm -hmm. probably from his background. His father, well, his whole family, as a matter of fact, it, I grew up in New Zealand not knowing it, but we used to have a thing called the Alex Lindsay String Orchestra, which was Jonathan's wife, Jane Lindsay, her father ran that. Right. And Jonathan's father also ran a, 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 he's a composer also in Wellington. So the, the, the whole thing has been, it's all part of my history mm. in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a different kind of way, in a very real way, actually. Mm. So it's just there, you know. And the, 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 that piece is just so evocative. I find it's got, it just, <laughs> I love it, can yeah. I say. Well, you can tell. I mean, I, I was completely transported listening to it. Um, it was really, really beautiful. Um, one of the things that I find in a space like that um, that doesn't often get discussed uh, on, in, in open conversations very often is where the time sits collectively. I know we're all responsible equally for the time, um, but it's such an interesting thing to talk about the roles um, within a piece of music like that. Um, would be nice to hear um, how you imagine those roles panning out, Jonathan, and then particularly Hamish, I'd like to talk to you about how you approach playing the drums in a context like that. Um, the nature of trust is a really, really beautiful one and those, those relationships that you've developed over years are, um, you, you can't quantify how important that is. Um, but Jonathan, how, how, does, how do you approach playing a ballad like that? Is it all about listening and deeply understanding you know, the, the, the inherent composition or Wow, it's such a um, that's such a big question. Um, mm. I personally, as a bass player, mm. am approaching that piece and and every piece, I guess, um, that's so open like that. As I'm listening like crazy yep. to what Mike and what Hamish are doing and trying to contribute to the whole and not get in the way. I think that's that's the really hard thing for me personally is, is just to remind myself not to get in the way. And so you have to be, you know, I've got a couple of really major heroes in music. One of them is Charlie Hayden, and I think he's kind of a master at that. I mean, all of the great, all of the great musicians, full stop, are, are masters at that, but it's something that I find that I have to keep bringing my attention back to, is to play just enough to hold it up and then stay the hell out of the way of everybody else so that they've, they've got room. And I wish I could say that I, I, I was successful at that, um, you know, a high percentage of the time, but, you know, I'm human, so. But it's certainly something I strive for. And that's what I'm doing. So I'm listening to Mike and I'm reacting and I'm listening to Hamish and I'm reacting. And, and if I feel that, it, that I can contribute something, then I will put that into the pot and see if anybody responds or goes with it and if they don't then they don't but you know mm. but it's basically listening to others do you feel from a 
a base role, like that sort of that 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 role, that chair. Do you feel like more of a primary timekeeper, or do you still feel like the time is equal across the board? Uh, I feel that the the time or the internal pulse is equal responsibility of everybody playing in the group. Mm-hmm. And um, when I was coming up, you know, when I was um, studying and then out in the in the world being a professional bass player way, way, way back, um, people felt that it was the drummer's job. And um, I just, it never felt like it was the drummer's job to me. It felt like it was everybody's job. And I n- knew that from in the situations where I was lucky enough to be in, where everybody was taking care of that stuff uh, and the music was so much better for it. Mm. So um, I, I think it's everybody's job and I think every, every musician on the stand has a responsibility to, to pay attention to the pulse and also not get in the way of it. Because if you're dragging or if you're rushing, you can get in the way of it, mm. of the piece, full stop. That's not to say you can't be human, you know, and people, we go with whatever's going on. Of course. But that is, it is to say that it's a really important consideration in, in one's musicality. And from a, like one last question, from a bass chair as well, you sort of talk about not getting in people's way, but one of the things that I've always adored about your playing is that you, you do seem to have that inherently beautiful melodic sensibility that allows you to lay down the foundation of the music where it's required, but also get in amongst it. I love it when bass players actually do get in amongst it and yet somehow still stay out of the way. Um, is that a difficult balance for you to strike? Is that what you referred to when you were saying, you know, you're, you're constantly on tenor hooks and, and listening like crazy? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing because um, what it is for me is I, I, I'm reacting, I'm reactive, and I'm not thinking about what will work or what won't work. I'm thinking, I'm listening to my inner voice as much as I'm listening to everything else and going through... Sometimes you have options of what you can play in, in that moment and that's a split second and you go with one and you miss it or you get it or, you know, and it wasn't quite as good as you thought it was going to be or, you know, mm. and then sometimes it, it works. But it's, it's all, it's again, it's about listening and it's also about listening to, to what you are hearing in the music as, as much as you're here as listening to what everybody else is playing. So I'm not conscious... I only bring that up because I, I, I want to make the point that I'm not really conscious of what I'm doing when I'm playing it. Um, I'm just reacting. Ah, thank you. And Hamish, again, that, that idea of not having to be a timekeeper I think is just so important. Um, the trust across the entire ensemble allowed you to just leave, play texturally more than... Yeah more than with time. It doesn't mean that maybe the swells and the, you know, the hits on the cymbals or the toms, etc., will actually be placed somewhere within mm. the groove of the time feel, but it allows you to play far more texturally um, with loads and loads of space and absolutely not be the timekeeper. Is that something that's a real um, lovely play field for you? <laughs> Liberation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's nice to, you know, jump the fence in that regard, I'm, I'm <coughs> listening to uh, both Mike and Jonathan talking about this. So, I mean, you know, we very rarely talk about, you know, stuff like this, but, um, or haven't done for many years. But, uh, I mean, there's, to me, there's like a James Brown quote that everyone in the band is a drum, you know, like, mm-hmm. so everybody's rhythm fits into the pocket, into the grid, you know, whatever it is, however you explain that thing. And then, to me, that's, that's a wonderful thing. And then you go either far left of that or far right where it all dissolves and it becomes um, arrhythmic and it can become just sounds that people are making, which I particularly love. And, um, I mean, I love the, the funk thing too. Whatever it is, that sort of you know, the, the, the rhythmic thing. But I also really love, and particularly on the drums, I, I love the, the idea of being able to not have that kind of hook-up that is, is so drumistic, you know. Yeah, it's right. nice to just have, to be able to hit a cymbal and let it ring out 
but with no kind of rhythmic concept behind the reason you hit it. It's not a big downbeat on one, here's the yeah. chorus, here it comes, you know. It's, it's just a lovely sound. It's a beautiful sound and it's a s sustained sound, which mm. is lovely for the drums. But, and, and, and just to um, agree with Jonathan, you know, like for me all, all the way along, it, it was pretty quick. I got the idea that, it's, yeah, it's not me, you know. Although I give myself a hard time in every situation and sometimes you can be given a hard time as a drummer, like it's the drummer's fault, you know. Or, hey, you don't have to say that to me, I've already, I've already, you know, yeah, I'm already in the handcuffs, you know, like in my own head. But, yeah, um, the idea that it's actually a group thing, and that's even better when it spreads across a group, you know, like when it's bass and drums, I'm kind of used to that, the, the agreement of bass and drums, that's a great thing. But when the time spreads, the responsibility spreads across the group, it's wonderful. And then all all different styles, like mm. whether it's a, a, a <clears throat> tighter thing where everyone's playing that, that drum, like everyone's playing the rhythms and stuff, or it's loose and it's beautiful, you know, it's great. Mm. I love it. I mean, yeah, hopefully we'll all be doing it for a long time. Yeah, I hope so. Mm. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Like you, if you hear young yeah. musicians sort of new to the game at that, that, that idea of that space and that flow and, and whatnot, is very stilted and, and very, very awkward. That's a really, really hard thing to teach. I think it can only come with experience. Are there, certain, are there certain drummers that maybe blazed a trail for you in, in being able to experience music like that? Um, yeah, I guess, um, well, you know, I mean, in that, that sort of sound uh, scape thing, I guess the, the sort of latter period of poor motion, like in his, you know, like I just, that thing just drives me nuts. Mm. You know, I just love that. I can listen to that all the time, you know. Just because, I, I don't know, just the sound that he gets out of the drums and the freedom that he has. The choices he made. Yeah, They're the choices. Extraordinary, you know. weren't they? Yeah. Witnessing that in person was, was like a total revelation for me. Yeah, I think me too. There was a point when I was younger where I did not get poor motion and how he did what he did and I saw it in person and was like, that's the most extraordinary accompaniment I've ever I've ever yeah. seen and and command of the music. It was just beautiful. Yeah. So, and yeah. I think also that, like you know, it is. I know it's a sort of funny thing to say, but it is just music as well. You know, like um, we have the opportunity. You know, it's a wonderful thing to do, like just to be able to make music with your friends and and and. Uh, kind of no one usually gets hurt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's Not kind anymore, of... Not anyway. Yeah, that's it. Well, at the moment we're all indoors. But, yeah, you know, it's a beautiful thing to do. And, yeah, it's... And, and, and it's, that's the other thing, apart from this, of course, being filmed and recorded, usually it's gone, you know. Yeah. You can drive home giving yourself a hard time, but actually you're the only one thinking about it. Everyone else is in bed or whatever. Mm. You know? And now that it's filmed and recorded, you can give yourself a hard yeah, time. Yeah, you can watch it over and <laughs> over right. again and Another just relive years. that awful moment when you went <laughs> in the wrong spot. Well, listen, I would just like to say thank you very much. It was an absolute delight. It was a complete treat. Just One, just to see you all, but to certainly hear you play music like that. Um, I'm very grateful, so thank you very much. Thank so. you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having us. I mean, I play music because I have to. It's a psychological thing. It's just, it's my calling. It's a calling, which means you do it regardless. And I've always done that. And I've seen it, as you said, I've seen great times and I've seen really bad times, you know, in terms of myself, in terms of financially, and in terms of interest. It, 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 it ebbs and flows. Mm. The thing is, though, I think the bottom line is, as a creator, if you don't have a passion, hey, do something else. If you're passionate, you're going to find a way to do it, mm -hmm. period, you know. So I don't know about the rest of the world, but that's where it comes from. It starts from you and it starts from your passion. Mm. And if you want to do it, you'll do it. You'll, you'll figure a out way. a way to do it. Yeah. And that's the case. Is, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So that's all I can offer as far as that goes. Because mm -hmm. I don't know what the future is going to hold. Let's face it, everything has changed in my lifetime. Everything's changed so drastically, particularly in the last... I was going to say last 10 years, but even less than that. It just keeps changing. So the change 
the, the rate of change has sped up exponentially. You know, so it's like, hey, I say, if you want to do something, look inside yourself and just, that's what it's, because it's about self-expression at its, at its root. That's what it's really all about.